Well, welcome and good morning, Memorial Road. Hope you are doing well. Thanks, Andy, for sharing all the wonderful projects we have going on. This is, this is one of my uh, favorite days in the sense that if, if you're new to this church family or, or you're wondering, okay, what's Memorial Road really all about? Well, this is, this is what we're about. We, we try to be a light to the world. We try to be a, a tangible um, um, light to the community t- to bring uh, true hope and and healing and food and relief to people that really need it. And so if, um, if that's something you want to be a part of, this is the place that it happens all the time. And so I love this month because we get to do quite a bit of that. So this is week two in a series that I started last week called Disagree Differently. And I, I really enjoyed several of the conversations and, and email exchanges this, this past week from the message. One of the favorite things that happened was, if, if you were here last week, this wasn't the main part of the message, but I, I, made this, I made the point that one of my really strange opinions is that when it comes to dessert, I would, I would be just as fine with a bowl of Raisin Bran as with a chocolate chip cookie, to the horror of most of you in the room. Now, I don't even know who this was, but I got to my office this morning, and somebody wrapped me a box of Raisin Bran. And I just, it just, it really made my morning. So I don't know who this was, but just know that this will be eaten and enjoyed. So thank you very much uh, for that. So I, things happen to me and, and sometimes they'll happen and I think, okay, that's going to make it into a sermon. But I have, I, I try to wait for the right timing because I don't just want to give you a good story, but it didn't really fit exactly with the message. Well, something happened in uh, April to a family member of mine and I, when it happened, I was like, oh, that's, that's fantastic. I can't wait for whenever that fits into a sermon. Well, today, it really fits into the sermon today. So here's the story. I have a niece. She, her name is Brooklyn, and she's a really good soccer player. She uh, just graduated from high school in the spring, and she's now playing in college. And in the spring, there was a really, really big game. And it was, it was with her high school, which was Circle Valley High, and they were playing one of their big rivals across the city. And so this, this uh, lot of anticipation for the game. And Brooklyn, being a senior, she's one of the leaders on the team. And so a few days before the game, she records a TikTok video to pump up her own teammates. And the TikTok video is simply just her flexing, like, we got this. Well, she puts it on TikTok, and, and, and her teammates are excited. And they're, oh, yeah, this is good. Brooklyn's pumped up. We're pumped up. Let's go win this game. Well, the opposing team also sees the video, and they think it's ridiculous. And so Brooklyn actually has a few people she knows at the other school, and they actually text her and they say, Brooklyn, we saw your video and we think it's stupid. In fact, we think it's so stupid that every time we score on your team, we're going to make a complete mockery of your pose. So this is like teenage girl drama at its peak. Like this is like, so this is like, this creates this back and forth all week of like, okay, this is like, they were already excited about playing the game, but now we've got this video drama and like everybody wants to win so badly because if you think about this, if Brooklyn's team wins the game, it really justifies the whole video. Like it was fine, it was a good thing, it was just rallying the troops, it was innocent, no, no problem. But if Brooklyn's team loses the game, then the other side can say your video was immature, it was ill-timed, it had poor taste. So th- there's a lot riding on this one game. So Friday comes and it is a physical game. Like nobody can score. First half, 0-0. Zero, zero. Second half goes on and it's still 0-0 zero, zero to towards the very, very end of the game. Well then Brooklyn, she's in the middle of the field. She steals the ball from the opposing team and she kicks a goal from 35 yards away. It sails over all the members of the other team and, and over the goalie and goes in the goal. And they scream and they, big victory celebration. It's very exciting. In fact, I'll, I'll show you a, a video of this goal. So go ahead and play that video. There's Brooklyn. So it's, I mean, it's quite a shot. It's, it's, it's really, in a lot of ways, the shot of her career. Now, that, that would make the story great in itself. The team goes home. A few hours later, Brooklyn and her family are just sitting around the living room, and they turn on the TV, and this happens. That night, that goal made it onto top 10 sports center for the whole country. And so, like, it's number three on the list. April 16th, 2021, that goal's number three on the list. 
And so I show up in Kansas the next day, Friday, and they tell me the story, and I'm just beside myself. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Like, that's the greatest way to win an argument, like, ever. Like, like, not only do you win the soccer game and do your victory dance, it's on national TV. Like, your opponent is decimated. Like, that'll never happen again. Like, that's what we dream about. In fact, you don't have to raise your hand on this one, but I want you to, just to answer this in your own mind, have you ever daydreamed about winning an argument? And you don't have to raise your hand because if I had you raise your hand, every single hand would go up because we have all daydreamed about winning an argument. A study from Harvard came out recently that said that we spend a staggering 46% of our waking hours daydreaming. And one of the things that we daydream about the most is winning an argument. Whether that's with a friend or your mom or your dad or your boss or, or your social media nemesis. Like we daydream about these things. And usually in our daydreams we have some great argument or some great source that we quote in this in impeccable logic. And we, we have all these wonderful things to say. And then the person that is arguing with us says, wow, you're right. I, j I just never knew it. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing this information with me. I'm going to change my mind. That's how the, the dream goes. Now, another question I have for you is, do your actual arguments go that way? <laughs> no. Why? Because that's a dream. And dream is not reality. So, for example, let, let me uh, read you a letter that you will never, ever, ever receive in the mail. Dear victorious debater, I graciously admit defeat. Your airtight arguments, credible sources, and all caps lettering have convinced me of the error of my ways. Please accept my humble apology and know that I will strive to make my opinions more like yours. Okay, that's not going to happen. You might want it to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so this series is about, okay, what do we do though? Like, what do we really do about disagreement? I, I introduced these Connect Four sets last week to, to make the case that if each one of these little Connect Four pieces represented one opinion that you had, and let's say you have hundreds, if not thousands of them, there's not a single person on planet Earth that would have the exact same opinion profile as you do. And so one of the big questions is not how do we avoid conflict and disagreement, but rather how do we steward it and what do we, what do, we do about it while it's there? And so I want to hop back into, I want to start in the text we ended in last week, Acts 15. And I, I want to make one more point, and then I actually want to give you two practical questions to ask yourself before you engage in an argument. Because the, the truth is, we all want the, sp <laughs> the iconic sports center ending to our arguments, but if, if that's not going to happen, we need a better way to measure how we're doing. We, we need a better system of criteria for how we engage arguments. So I want to give you two questions that to ask before you would go into an argument. But Acts 15, I, I want to go back there for just a minute and make an observation or two. So if you remember, Acts 15 is, is the most significant church meeting about the most significant problem of the day. The question very clearly is, do Gentiles need to be circumcised to be Christians? And after the meeting... The clear answer to that question is no. Gentiles do not need to be circumcised to be Christians. Well, if you flip one page over in your Bible to Acts chapter 16, Paul meets Timothy. And he's the next big thing. He's the young new protege. He's, he's going to be a big church leader. Well, here's what chapter 16 verse 3 says. Paul wanted to take him along for the journey, so he circumcised him because of the Jews who lived in that area. Well, that didn't make a lot of sense. The church had just decided this was not necessary. Case closed, argument solved. Why is Paul doing this? Well, one reason is this. Big arguments are kind of like big earthquakes. They often have aftershocks. And so it'd be nice to think that whatever argument you're having with someone or disagreement, you, you, it'd be nice to think, well, we'll just have a good conversation or two and then it'll just be done. But that's not how arguments work. Last week I made the point that arguments have history, and it's good to know the history. But it's also true that 
pretty much every argument also has a future. There's going to be other things that happen, outworkings of this dis disagreement. I mean, if there was ever a case in the Bible where there should have been this nice, neat, tie the, the bow on, put the period at the end of a sentence, close the chapter on, on the book, or like this would be it. This was Paul and, and Peter and, and Barnabas and James. Like this should have been the meeting of all meetings. And, and yet the very next chapter, they're, they're questioning the, the decision. Isn't that odd? See, disagreements don't just go away because you have one good conversation. Well, here, here's another example. Again, this is from the exact same part of the Bible. I, I think this one's almost funny. So Acts 15, if, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, and obviously I've been talking about it for two weeks now, the whole chapter is about conflict resolution and these people that come together and there's deep listening and, and there's discernment and there's a process and the Holy Spirit is involved and it's this amazing paradigm for how we can handle our own disagreements. However, have you ever read the very next section in Acts 15? Like 35 verses about the meeting. What does your subheading say if you're looking at your Bible? At the very next section. Here's what the subheading is. Disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. It's in the same chapter. So the most significant model of conflict resolution in the Bible happens in the same chapter where we find the subtitle, Disagreement between Paul and Barnabas. And this one doesn't get resolved. Now this one is not a doctrinal disagreement like the previous one. This is more of a personality thing where John Mark, who's another helper, he has abandoned the missionary trip, and he wants back in. And Paul says no, because the, the mission of God is, is too important for unreliable people. And Barnabas says yes, everyone deserves a second chance. And these two people get an argument about it. And then verse, in verse uh, 39, we read this. They had such a sharp disagreement that they parted company. Now, I have a dual reaction to this particular verse. One reaction that I have is, is disappointment because I think, okay, if, like if Paul and Barnabas can't solve this, these leaders of the church, and, and Barnabas is, is called the son of encouragement, like he's a nice, kind, positive person, and Paul writes so much about love and unity. Like if they can't solve their argument, it just makes me feel despair, like we're all doomed. That's my first reaction. My second reaction is comfort because it, what I realize is that this disagreement did not stop the spread of the gospel. The Holy Spirit didn't come onto the scene and say, oh no, what are we going to do? Like, we, we, there's still people that need Jesus, people need to be saved, people need to repent, people need to get baptized, like the gospel needs to spread, the kingdom needs to grow, but I, I, we're, we can't move on until you boys work this out. Like that, that's not what happens. So the disagreement does not derail the mission of God. Like that's really good news. And so all this to say, one, one really important foundational piece to just put in your mind and put in your heart as you think through your own conflict and you, as you think through your own argument is simply this. Disagreement is not necessarily a sign of dysfunction. Sometimes we think those two are equal. Now it can be. When disagreement leads to hatred, when it leads to violence, when it leads to abuse, yeah, that's, that's dysfunctional. But most of the time, you know what disagreement is? It's one person that says, I see it this way. And another person says, okay, well, I see it this way. That's not dysfunctional. That's just life. And so one of, one of the steps forward for all of us as we learn how to disagree differently and disagree in healthier ways is simply this. It's to destigmatize the very notion of disagreement. You really can be in disagreement with somebody in your life, and that doesn't mean that your life's falling apart. You can be in disagreement with someone really close to you, and that doesn't mean that your life is falling apart. Apart, disagreement is not necessarily a sign of dysfunction. I want to remind you of something I've, I've, I've told you about over the years, but it's just it's so significant. John Gottman is the leading researcher in the last 75 years of marriage and, and family uh, therapy. 
And one of his big findings, probably his, the biggest finding over all of his longitudinal studies was this. 69% of problems in marriages never get resolved. Like, ever. And so, you, you know, the problems of, well, how are we going to raise our kids? And how are we going to handle our money? And, and how are we going to take care of the home? And, and what are we going to do with our in-laws? And, like, all those problems, 69% of them do not get resolved. And now, for some marriages, they, that tends to cause a big problem, and, and they eventually get divorced. But for a lot of these marriages, they, they stay together. <laughs> they stay together in the midst of all of these significant problems. And, and Godman actually has also in his research, the traits and factors of the couples that stay together, even amid the conflict. And I'm going to share those with you in just a a few minutes. But for now, just know that if you have a conflict with a friend, and if you have a conflict with a family member, that, that doesn't mean that it's all falling apart. Disagreement is not necessarily a sign of dysfunction. Now, I want to go back to this question, what do you really do about it? So, oh no, before I get there, one more quote from a book. Uh, Dan Weil, uh, he wrote a book called After the Fight, and it's a, it's a book about interpersonal conflict, and he had a great line, and he made the line about marriage, but we can apply it to, to different parts of life. And his line is this, choosing a partner is choosing a set of problems. That's a really helpful thought. And so, for example, let's say that there's a guy named... Paul, and that Paul marries Amber. And Paul and Amber go to some social gathering, and on the way home, they get in this really big argument. Because Paul is really shy and introverted, and Amber's really outgoing and extroverted. And Amber stayed way too long talking with the friends, and and Paul was done like an hour before they left. And so they get in a fight on the way home, and Paul says, "You, you, you know that I don't like being around people. Why did you stay so long? And Paul thinks as they're driving away, why did I even marry her? Now, let's just rewind history. Let's say Paul didn't marry her. Let's say Paul had married someone completely different. Like, let's say her name is Susan. Well, Paul and Susan would have had a different set of problems. Maybe, maybe their problem would be that Paul is very punctual and he's always on time and Susan is always late. And so Paul always feels like he's taken for granted and, and Susan always feels like Paul's trying to control her. And so that's what they fight about on their way to the party. Well, and let's just throw a third scenario out. Let's say, let's stick with Susan now, and let's say that Susan didn't marry Paul. Let's say Susan married Bob. And, and Susan and Bob, they wouldn't have even gone to the party because Susan and Bob would have been arguing about who was supposed to do which household chore the day before. And so the point is, choosing a person to marry really is choosing a set of problems. Choosing a friend is choosing a set of problems. Choosing a church is choosing a set of problems. Choosing any business, any organization, any club is choosing a set of problems. And so again, just trying to escape it isn't going to work. We have to learn how to deal with it. So I want all that to say, I want to give you two really, really practical questions to ask yourself before you engage in an argument. Or or after an argument, you can ask these questions in retrospect and how did you do in the argument. And they, they both come from a text in 1 Peter, a really, really helpful passage. 1 Peter chapter 3. Peter in this text is giving counsel to Christians who find themselves at odds with a culture that does not support their faith and does not support their virtues. And so Peter is saying, okay, here's how you navigate being in disagreement with this kind of culture, these kinds of people. So he says in verse 15, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. And I I actually want to pause there because I think this is a really important statement that Peter is making here. He's encouraging Christians, be convicted. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Like make that a core conviction in your heart. And I think it's important to say this because I, I don't want you to interpret this series as well, what you believe really doesn't matter. That's not what I'm saying at all. Be really convicted about your faith, about your beliefs, like, and, and have, it, have it go to the core of your heart. Like, If you disagree with someone, that doesn't mean you're not a devoted Christian. And so, so Peter is saying you're, you have this core conviction in your heart, like know that Jesus Christ is Lord. But, but also pay attention, and even though it's one small phrase here, he says, in your heart. 
set apart Christ Jesus as Lord. Meaning, you can't set Christ Jesus as Lord in anybody's heart but your own. And so one of the big problems with this agreement is we, even though we know this isn't true, sometimes we act like we can legislate the opinions of other people. Like you, you can't. You can come to your own convictions, but it stops there. You don't have any power to decide something for somebody else when it comes to their beliefs. So that's the first thing Peter says. In your heart, set apart Christ Jesus as Lord. Here's the second thing he says. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks the reason for the hope that you have. Be prepared. Those are two really, really important words here. And so here's the first question that I would say, this is what you should ask yourself before you go into an argument. And the question is, have you done your homework? That's what be prepared means. It's like, have you, have you done your reading? Have you done your research? Have you really thought through this? And so for Peter's audience, he, he might put it like this. Have you really thought through why you believe Jesus is Lord? Why he is the Messiah? Have you really thought through why it's not Caesar? Like, do, do you know why you believe what you believe? And this is a really important virtue in the Bible. Do your homework. In fact, they're all over the New Testament, you can find example after example. So, so Acts chapter 17. The Bereans were of more noble character because they studied the scriptures daily to see if what Paul said was true. And this is like a good thing. They're really doing their homework. Or even at the end of Luke, chapter 24, when Jesus is walking on, on the road to Emmaus. And these people are like, ah, Jesus died, and we're not sure what to think of it. Well, Jesus has a Bible study with them. And he reads the Old Testament with them to prove that he is the Messiah. In other words, he's, obviously he's wrote the book, so it's easy for him to do homework, but he's, he's done his homework. And, and this is really important for you and I. And when we engage in, in arguments and disagreement, it's not just to, to be passionate about it, but really do the reading, do the research, do the, do the homework. Like, like really spend time thinking through, not, not just your position, but what does the other side think? And how, how do they articulate their position? And where do their views come from? In fact, it, you've heard of I, I, we got the iPod, we got the iPad, we got the iPhone, we got the iCloud. Let me give you two more eyes. We got the iWave, I. W A V, and we got the IRA, I R A A. I W A V and I R A A. Now, here's what those stand for. And you really want to, you really want to be uh, cautious about these two things. Beware if this is the primary way that you handle conflict. I W A V, I watched a video. I R A A, I read an article. That's good. Great. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm glad that you know how to click buttons. That's, that's good. And you can watch videos. And, that, and, and it is. I'm not, I'm, I don't want to be trite here. That is part of homework is, is reading and, and, and watching. And, and that's good. Sometimes when we do that, we think it's homework, but it's really just confirmation bias. Well, I'm just watching things that I already agree with, or I'm just reading things that I already agree with. And that, again, that's, there's nothing inherently wrong with that, but I'm just saying go further than that. Read five to six articles. Go, go read people you disagree with. And, and better than that is just to sit down in front of somebody you disagree with and just say, hey, can you share with me what you believe and why you believe it? Like, that's, like, that's homework. Like, like, you owe it to yourself. You owe it to God to do the hard work of homework. So that, that's the first question to ask yourself is, when you're engaging in a disagreement, have I really done my homework? Now, here's the next thing Peter says. But do this, and this is so important. We miss, <laughs> we spend so much time on the first half of this verse. The second half is so important. Do this with gentleness and respect. Okay, that's not homework. That's something different. Here's the second question to ask yourself before you engage in an argument. Number one, have I done my homework? Number two, have I done my heart work? Heart work is very different than homework. Heart work is when you are close enough to God that you don't overreact when somebody says something that you disagree with. Heart work is when you have the ability to let go of hate. Heart work is when you have the ability to let go of control. Heart work is the ability to listen 
very, very deeply and very, very well. Heart work is the choice, like we talked about last week, to see a person, not an opinion. Heart work includes kindness, generosity, gentleness. And to be completely honest, heart work, at least in my opinion, is a lot harder than homework. Like, anybody can speak their mind. But very few people can actually love their enemy. Heart work is really really hard. So let, let me give you an example here. So 2018, there was an interesting event that took place in a library in a town in Vermont, and there uh, two political candidates running for local offices, and one was Zach Mayo, Republican, and he was running against Lucy Rogers, who was Democrat. And uh, they both wanted to win, obviously, and they had spent uh, the last several months canvassing their county, and they'd each knocked on 2,000 homes, just, just trying to make their case to get elected. Well, they had this debate at a local library, and it was a long debate, and they debated education, gun control, you name it. Reporters were there, the video cameras were on. Well, the debate ended, and the reporters were putting away their cameras and microphones and all that, and Zach and Lucy said, can you keep your equipment up and running for just a few minutes? And Zach and, and, and Lucy, they, they pushed all the chairs away, and they brought in two chairs, and they brought in two music stands, and Zach brought out his guitar, and Lucy brought out her cello, and they ended the debate by playing a duet. And the song that they played was a song in which the lyrics longs for more mercy in the world. In fact, these two candidates had had to meet a week before to, to rehearse for two hours because they really wanted to make this point clear that, that yes, we do want to win the argument, and we, we do want to be, be elected, but at the end of the day, we... We have to do so with respect, and we have to do so with dignity, and we have to do so with, with honor. And this is the point that First Peter is making. Yes, do your homework. Be prepared so that you know what to say. But more than that, you've got to do your heart work so that you can bring the, the kind of self and the kind of being into the conversation so that people can actually see the God that you represent. Logic has limits. You can have the perfect argument. You can have the right resources. You can have the impeccable reasoning. But without gentleness and respect and empathy, the argument can only travel so far. So I, I want to give you a really heady quote from G.K. Chesterton where he talks about this. And G.K. Chesterton was someone who greatly influenced C.S. Lewis. And he, I really like what he says about this particular subject. He says, if you argue with a madman, and, and for our purposes, let's define madman as somebody who has done all the homework but not the hard work. So a madman, he, he has the logic but not the, the gentleness and not the respect. That's what, that's what Chesterton means by madman. If you argue with a madman, he says, it is extremely probable that you will get the worst of it. For in many ways, his mind moves all the quicker for not being delayed by things that go with good judgment. He's not hampered by a sense of humor or by charity. And so what he's saying at this point in the quote is he's saying, we all have logic and we have reasoning and we can put our arguments together, but we have non-logical components to our personhood as well. Things like love and compassion and, and, and a sense of humor and empathy, and those are all very much a part of who we are. So the madman... He's saying if, if they're only accessing the logic, but they're not accessing all these other things, if those parts of their being are dormant, then the logic just has, has free reign. Quote continues. He says, Indeed, the common phrase for insanity in this respect is a misleading one. The madman is not the man who has lost his reason. The madman is the man who has lost everything except his reason. See, here's what he means by that. Normally, we, we would say that a crazy person is the one that has lost their mind. But what Chesterton is saying is that, no, the crazy person is not the one who has lost their mind. The crazy person is the one who has lost their heart, but has kept their mind. Because when you lose your heart, but you keep your mind, then there's nothing to stop you from being a jerk. And that's why it's so important. Yes, do your homework. Read. Be educated. Read the opposing side. Do your homework. But even more importantly, you've got to do your heart work. 
how can you be the kind of person that goes into an argue, argument as a calm, non-anxious presence who won't overreact to people that disagree with you? So you know what Gottman said were the factors that kept people together in disagreement? So to remind you, he says that 69% of conflict in marriages does not get resolved. And he, he did all, all these studies of like, okay, so what, what is the kind of behavior that keeps couples together in the middle of the conflict? And here's what he discovered. The number one predictor of marriages that stayed together was what he called affective behavior. And, and here's what affective behavior is. It's, it's very small things. It's things like laughing together smiling at each other, eye contact, deep listening, positive physical touch. He said those, those are the couples that stay together. In fact, some of his studies, he would have people observe sessions he was doing, and they would just mark how many times those things happened in a session. And there was a high correlation between those factors and the people that stayed together for decades despite having disagreements that lasted for decades. It was the inside jokes. It was the humor. It, it was the warmth that they shared together. Those things covered over the disagreement. So all this to say, agreement is actually not a requirement for relationship. You can be in relationship with people, and you can be in deep relationship with people that you actually disagree with. So all this to say, what, what, what's the big ideas here? Number one, a, as you walk into disagreement, number one, have you done your homework? Number two, have you done your heart work? So be prepared to give an answer, but do this with gentleness and respect. Now, let me give you the big why on, on why you should do your heart work. The very next verse in Peter is actually really, really significant. So again, just so you're tracking with me. Verse 15, he says, set apart in your hearts Christ Jesus as Lord. In the next line, he says, be prepared to give your answer. Do this with gentleness and respect. And here's why. And this is such, I'm so glad this line is in here. Here's why. Verse 16. So that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. So in other words, what he's saying is this. You are to treat those you disagree with with so much respect and honor and humility and compassion that they second guess why they don't like you. You do your homework to win, but you do your heart work to witness. And we need more people who are ready to be faithful witnesses, not just people who desperately want to win. In fact, I would make the case that it is Christians who desperately want to win their battle or their argument who are precisely the Christians in the country and in the world who are giving Jesus a bad name because they're not honoring God with respect and, and dignity. And that's why heart work is so important. You do your heart work so that you could witness. Now again, case in point, think about this. Jesus, as he is going to his crucifixion, has this really tense moment where he is on trial. And the man with all the authority, Pilate, is standing in front of him saying, what, who are you? And Don't you realize that I have the power to kill you? And then just outside is a mob of people yelling, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And what does Jesus do? The man who could win any argument. He sits in silence. In fact, Jesus carries himself with so much honor and dignity and grace and compassion and love that Jesus convinces Pilate that Jesus is innocent. And Pilate starts to try to free Jesus. He's like, I don't want to kill you. And three times he goes back to the crowd like, are you sure? Like, I can release somebody to you. Are you sure you want Barabbas? They're like, no, we, we want you to kill Jesus, kill Jesus. But Jesus convinced Pilate not based on his logic, but based on his love. 
And so far too often today we think that we will win the day because of our clever insight and our arguing and because we read an article or watched the video. And again, we should do those things, but I'm just saying if you really want to make an impact on people, do it the Jesus way. Do it the Peter way. We said to treat people with respect and be gentle about it because it could just be that the way you handled your disagreement is the very thing that brought that person to Christ. If you'll bow with me uh, in a word of prayer. Father, this is a hard subject because we all have passions and opinions and we all have people we disagree with. But Father, I personally, in just in studying for this, have been convicted through this text that I need to be more respectful. I need to be more gentle with people I disagree with. And so Father, I, I am praying that your spirit will work its way into our hearts not so that we'll be less convicted, but so, Father, we can be more compassionate. Help us to be people that are full of logic, but that are also full of love. And, Father, help us to be people that do homework, but also do our heart work. Because, Father, we want, we want the world to know you. And we want the world to know your son, Jesus. And so help us to be faithful witnesses so that the world can see just that. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. So as we sing this next song, if there is something going on in your life and you need the church to pray for you, we want to make that opportunity available. The heart of the gospel is, is not a man who wins an argument. The heart of the gospel is a man that lays down his life so that people can have their sins forgiven and have the hope of eternal life. That's what it means to be a Christian. And so as we sing this song, if, if you're not a Christian and you want to be a Christian... You repent of your sins and you get baptized. And if you want to do that this morning, we'd love to do that for you. Let's stand and sing.